All righty, welcome to module two of TDM 345, where we are going to talk about pre-planning for a meeting and or convention. So what are we gonna cover this week? Smart objectives and goals, site selection, briefly touch base on the audience, determining a budget at a high level. We'll talk about that more throughout. We'll infuse that throughout. Briefly talking about what does a theme mean for a conference? How do you develop partnerships? Very, very, very high level scheduling. And then as well as building your team. So let's talk about setting goals and objectives. You can refer to pages 246 to 248 in your textbook um, where a lot of this content is from. So creating meeting objectives and event objectives. This is really important so that you understand what you are working toward and what you are wanting to achieve. Your objectives serve as the basis of your planning process. If you don't know what you're working for or toward, how are you going to develop a plan to meet that goal? Your objectives should be clear, concise, and measurable. And that's very important when we think about when we're going to talk about the SMART goals. But you want them to be clear so that everyone knows what they're working toward. You want them to be concise so that it's not a really drawn out objective and people get lost in what you're trying to actually achieve. And then you want it to be measurable so people understand how they are going to achieve that. Your objectives should drive how your program is planned out. And we'll talk about that in the scheduling in, I want to say, two modules. And you really should make sure that you are also focusing on your attendees. You're going to have objectives from your board. You're going to have objectives from the overall association. But you also want to make sure what is the return on investment for your attendee. So for example, for my North American Association Conference, this upcoming year for our conference, I'm at ballpark, we're estimating that an attendee is going to spend approximately just over $2,000 to attend this conference from registration, flight, hotel, ground travel. Actually, I'll probably say it's probably going to be closer to twenty three dollars to 2500 depending where the person is flying from. So if me, as so, let, for example, I want to bring my event coordinator to our upcoming conference so that he can continue to learn about graduations outside of what I'm teaching him. How am I going to justify his twenty the twenty five hundred dollars that I'm going to spend out of my budget for that? So as we so as we think about that, who is the audience that's going to be attending your event? Who is the group? Why are they here? And what is their objective? What is their objective for attending the meeting? Is it professional development? Is it networking? Um, so a big, we, for NACO, we saw a big uptick in people wanting to attend our conference in 2021 due to COVID. And they really wanted to hear from other universities of how they're handling the COVID situation. Um, let's say in Phoenix, or not Phoenix, just in the word, a big thing is microchips. And let's say someone's putting a conference on around that. People are going to want to attend that to learn how they adapt this microchip technology with into their existing practices and technology. So understanding who that group, why they are wanting to attend, and what is their objective. Now, your goals impact every aspect of the meeting, almost every aspect, from where you're going to take place, have the meeting take place, to what types of food and beverage you're going to serve, not just like I'm not going to serve hamburgers versus pasta, but what meals will you actually serve? Breakfast, lunch, receptions, breaks, snack breaks, or is it going to be on their own? What type of transportation is necessary? So we were contemplating doing a conference at Northern Arizona University, uh, which is about two hours north of uh, the Phoenix Metro Valley. And when we were contemplating, do we do a meeting there? Well, we said, 
we would have to pay for a charter bus for people flying in because more most of the people would have to fly into Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport and then fly up, or sorry, then drive to Flagstaff. So that can be an impact of whether or not you want to do it. Your meeting goals can also set up what your room layout looks like, depending on do you want it to be more educational focused or do you want it to be more social and allowing people to talk, rounds versus theater slash classroom setup. And obviously, what type of programming are you putting on? As I mentioned in the previous slide, three reasons that people mostly attend are education, they're there to learn something, networking, they're there to meet other people with of like-minded interest, or they're there to conduct business, meaning they're there to sell something, close a deal, or explore new business. So let's talk a little bit about smart objectives, not smart objects, sorry, um, in the context of a meeting. So an objective needs to be smart. You've probably heard this acronym many, many times ago. Specific, meaning I can tell you exactly what we're going to do. Measurable, I know exactly the metric that I'm trying to meet. It is attainable. It's not something that's lofty, so I'm not trying to solve world hunger. It is something that is relevant and it is time-based so that we know we're doing it within a certain amount of time. So an example of a meeting objective is I'm going to generate attendance at a specific hotel. So that is specifically from someone, let's say, who is a meeting planner and they generally contract out with certain hotels. So for my MAKO association, um, our uh, previous management company, association management company that we worked with, they had a partnership with the Fairmont Hotel brand. So the meeting planner, their goal was to make sure that their associations that they worked with booked at Fairmont Hotels. Now, what that allowed was they got better deals because they said, hey, well, if you give us these deals, we'll put all of our meetings at your hotel. So that's an example of generating attendance at a specific hotel. Create a program by a certain date. Um, so for NACO, our goal is to have all of our educational sessions and our program where they're going to be slotted by, by, it was actually October 15th. I'm a few days behind because I'm waiting on some feedback for one thing um, so that we can then publish that program as a part of the registration. The registration is now open, but we know that if people know what they're going to be learning, that will drive more registration. We want to create a specific conference for specific attendees. So I am creating a conference for people who plan graduation. I want to complete my designs of the program, plans or graphics for the meeting by a certain date because we need to get that to print or give it to a graphic designer or a copy setter to make it formatted for digital. Those are all examples of SMART objectives. So. In your module two quiz, I want you to understand what SMART means, and but most importantly, how it's applied in the context of a meeting and not just memorizing the definition. Because what I'm going to propose to you in the quiz, I'm gonna give you an example of an object, of an object, an example of an object, of an objective, and you're gonna tell me whether or not that meets the SMART criteria or which of the five does it meet. So now is a good place to take a break if you want to. And then we'll be right back and we will start with site selection. So if you're back, now we're back from the break for site selection. This is gonna be on page 248 to 251 of your textbooks. So after you've established your meeting objectives, now you want to determine where is this conference going to take place. This is generally a group decision, not a one all in, not just one person dictating this, maybe unless you're in the business section, the business sector. But if you are in a association, education, government, or for the most part anywhere, it's going to be a group decision that people are taking to account. So factors that you want to consider when booking your site is 
what is the rot rotation of the location that you're in? So an example with NACO, we tried to do east, west, sorry, eastern United States, western United States, southern United States, central, Canada East, Canada West. That's not the specific order, but we try to make sure that we're going to all those different areas because that will affect the pricing for our universities in those respective areas. So it is cheaper for me to fly from Phoenix to San Francisco where we're considering our conference for 2025 than it is for me to go to Montreal, uh, Quebec in Canada where we went a couple years, few years ago. And so that will determine my budget as an attendee, where do I wanna go? For our trade publications, that's important to understand where is that organization based and where are their primary memberships based, where their primary members who contribute to that trade. Where are they based? You wanna go somewhere that is convenient for them. What is the location of your majority of attendees? Um, this is very, very important right now in the public sector um, because depending on where people are located, they may not be able to travel to other places. So, for example, for NACO, um, our upcoming conference, not 2023, but 2024, will take place in Fort Worth, uh, Texas. Because of Texas, a lot of our, most of our universities that are public in California cannot attend because of the governor's order to not support states that have discriminatory practices. So we know that anybody in California cannot go to that conference. We were considering Arizona for 2025. We are, Arizona is also on that list. So therefore we have to decide, do we go to Arizona in 2025 or do we go somewhere where our California attendees can go? That's something we have to weigh as a board. California can't be just a driving factor, but we do know that we have a significant amount of public universities in California that are members of NACO. So we wanna make sure that they can attend the conference. What is the cost for the planner and the attendees? So larger markets are generally more expensive. So New York, uh, Las Vegas, San Francisco, Seattle, uh, um, Canada in certain times of the years, um, New Orleans, a lot of those places, Chicago, a lot of those, San Diego, a lot of those places are more expensive. So we have to make sure, is that something that's within cost of our attendee that they can attend? The mode of travel. As I mentioned, most of the time people are flying, but can people drive or can people take trains? That will increase, that will help decide whether or not a person can attend. Um, as I mentioned with the NAU factor, people can fly into Phoenix, but then they still have to go to two hours to go to NAU. That could be a deterrent. So we have to decide that. Um, if you can put something near a major airport, that will always do well. Or if it isn't near a major airport, at least if there is great public transportation or costly um, ground travel rides there. So for example, in Vancouver, our hotel, I want to say, is 30 minutes away from the airport, um, but there are multiple ways. I want to say the taxi from the airport to the hotel was $50, but I went with four of the people, so we just split that. Um, but there were also, there was also a light rail that went from the airport all the way down to the hotel. So that's also great. Public transportation, it's easy. You want to make it easy. Then you also have to consider your type of hotel or meeting facility. Facility. Does this place have rooms at a great cost for you that's reasonable? Do they have enough rooms? If you're a larger association with a large exhibit hall, do you have a space that has enough square footage to meet your exhibit hall space? All things you have to consider. Now let's talk about budget. That really plays a place a play into your site selection. So next to the objectives is budget. You have to think about what will it cost to produce the event? Um, what is the cost overall? So some of the conferences can cost upwards of a million dollars. Some can be in the 100 to 200,000 range. 
Some can be multi-million dollars, depending on the amount of people coming in and the sponsorships and where they're at. Who's going to pay for those costs? And this is not just, is it the organization, but rather, are, is there enough money in your coffers to support to start booking stuff and putting down payments? Or do you have to wait for registration fees to come in before you start doing stuff? As I mentioned, will there be a registration fee? Some people do conferences for free, and that may and that may be covered by sponsors, or it's just more of a we want to market, so it is free. Or people are paying to attend the conference. So, for example, our NACO conference registrants attend. I want to say our cost this upcoming year is going to be about fourteen hundred bucks, if I remember correctly. People are paying fourteen hundred dollars, and we have costs built into that that it has to cover. What types of food and beverages are going to be provided? Um, generally, the higher your registration fee, more likely than not, people are expecting food and beverage to be provided significantly. Um, so for our NACO, we provide, for our NACO conference, we provide breakfast and lunch, multiple snacks and coffee and whatnot throughout the day. We do not provide dinner, but we do provide a um, some receptions throughout the evening, but it's not designed to replace the dinner just to hold them over. Will additional costs be passed on to the attendees? So additional costs such as your registration fee for your vendor, um, for your registration system, will that be passed on? Um, or let's say you're doing an ancillary activity of, as I mentioned, so I want to go to the Grand Canyon. Is that going to be a part of the registration fee? Or are you going to include, are you going to, sorry. Or are you going to charge somebody $100, $200 for that? Things to all consider. Then you also have to think about what revenue streams are available to you. Um, that could be your registration, sponsorships, partnerships, people purchasing ads, in-kind gifts for donations. I'm going to pause this. Give me one second to figure out what's wrong with my dog. So um, the revenue streams, sorry about that, my dog. Uh, she does not like the trash truck that pulls into the apartments behind us. <laughs> okay, then what else? You want to establish your financial goals. You want to include a smart approach. So for example, in, um, we would like to increase external sponsorships by 30% for this year, or we would like to bring in 100 new attendees from the Southeast region of the United States. These should be set by the planner, your association, or there may be a corporate mandate that you have to do, but you want to make sure that you are um, thinking about what are your goals. And that goal, when by setting those goals, it'll help you establish how you're going to achieve that. So as I said, if we wanna increase, bring in a hundred people from the Southeast region, we are going to make sure that we are building educational content that is relevant to those people from the Southeast region. Then you also wanna determine what are your financial expectations of an event? There are three possible financial outcomes. Break even, meaning I spent $200,000, I brought in $200,000 worth of revenue, or as close to as possible. Profit, I spent $200,000, I made $300,000. Um, and then deficit, I spent $200,000, but we only brought in $100,000. There are pros and cons to each of these, it's something that once again, you have to decide that based on your board or whoever is the decision maker. So as I mentioned, generally for education, our goal is to break even, um, especially for public education, unless it is done in partnership with somebody where there is a profit, where they want to make a profit. Um, for an association, most of the time, their goal is to make a profit. That profit allows the association to continue putting on other events, um, obviously to pay the salaries of the folks who are um, producing these conferences and put, hopefully 
if they are doing it correctly, because even though an association is a nonprofit, they can still make profit from this. And if they are a nonprofit, hopefully they're we are investing the reinvesting those profits in other educational offerings or things to bring value to their membership. And sometimes it is just truly to put a deficit because it is just name recognition or you are providing a critical function or service or education to a community. Then you want to identify your expenses and revenue sources. So an indirect cost is over or administrative item. So an example of that would be the salary of your meeting planner. Um, that is going to be, um, that can be an indirect cost or they could also be a fixed cost, but that would normally be an indirect cost if it, you are a part of an association, your meeting planner is shared. Then you have your fixed costs expenses incurred, incurred regardless of the number of attendees. So that could be an example of that would be I am renting out a ballroom and even if I get 100 attendees or I get 50 attendees, I'm still paying for that ballroom as well as the technology in it. Your variable costs are going to be based on your number of attendees. So that is generally your food and beverage. How many buses do you need to rent? tickets for a game that you may allow people to attend to, um, how many badges you have to print. Um, that's an example of a variable cost. So depending on how many attendees you have, that's how much money you're going to spend on them. Now, some revenue sources are going to be your revenue or your registration fees, how much are you are charging the attendee to bring to attend corporate or association funding. So that association funding, um, that could be, I may produce a conference for all of my attendees and they don't have to pay because they pay a significant registration due to the association. Therefore, they um, get to attend this for free. So that's where you may see the break even type of event or a deficit. Private funding, somebody is just paying for something for people to attend not that common anymore. Exhibitor fees or sponsorships, that's another big source of revenue. And that's where somebody is paying to exhibit. Um, so for example, for NACO, our exhibitors are people who provide um, name reading cards for graduation. So how people read your name, um, program printing or regalia, all those little things you see at graduation, somebody is probably, um, it's something we are probably paying for because it's something we can't provide in-house. Sponsorships, um, that's another source of revenue. So let's say you want to give every one of your attendees a pen or a water bottle. You can pay for that as an association yourself, or you can work with a sponsor to say, hey, um, Amazon, I'm looking at an Amazon pen that I have. Do you want to provide us 1,000 pens and you can market your Amazon basics line at this conference? They can say yes or no. Maybe you can take sponsorship class to learn more about that. And that's also part of the logo merchandise. You can also sell things. Um, so, you know, let's say you purchased a pin. You can normally buy a pin for about 56, 56 cents to a dollar for a decent pin, two, three dollars for a really nice pin. And you can turn around and sell that for $10. Or I've seen uh, when I was at NASPA, they used to have some nice clear uh, mugs like the Starbucks mugs where it's NASPA branded. Um, and based on my history, normally we pay about three bucks for them. You buy them in bulk, buy 500. Um, actually, yeah, you buy 500 of them and they turn around and some $15 each. Now you have to store and ship all that. So there are additional costs with that, but you can bring in more money that way because people want to sell where your brand. I've been asking my NACO folks for a NACO polo because I want a NACO polo, but that's me. So in your module two quiz, we're gonna, you're gonna be able to identify what the different types of costs are, variable, um, indirect, direct, and then as well as those financial outcomes. And I'll provide you an example. And you're gonna tell me which is which. Um, here's another great place to take a break or take a pause if you want to before we move into the next session, next section. So let's talk a little bit about theme development. The purpose of the theme is to set the tone for the conference. What are attendees going to take away at the conference?
Okay, so theme sets the tone for the conference. Um, it allows, when you're setting that, allows to for creativity around things that you're doing. So for example, with one of the um, retreats that I did, we did ours at the Diamondbacks theme, at the Diamondbacks uh, Chase Field. And so all of our staff, we wore referee shirts too, because we were you know, trying to look like we're referees as a sporting thing. It allows sessions to be designed around the conference theme. So for example, for Oneko, I can't remember the exact theme and I was trying to find it and apparently I don't have it written down anywhere, but I know that we're really looking at to going back to the basics. What are the necessary components to plan a conference? And so that's what we infuse in all of our call for proposals. The location can matter when it comes to creating a theme because you wanna make sure that that theme can be done in your location. So I'm not going to do a referee style sporting theme in a museum of art if I'm, that's my venue. Partnerships are also very important when you're planning because that's gonna drive what takes place at the conference. Those partnerships can be your sponsors, um, sorry, that's not can be. Your sponsors are a partner of your organization, whether or not you like it. They do kind of, they have a significant stake, mostly being financial, and they wanna make sure that they are meeting their financial objectives by investing in you. You can host it uh, with a partner organization. So a conference I hosted this last May was our public management research conference. And there were three partners a part of this. Um, one's not listed, but ASU was one, our School of Public Affairs, and then University of Arizona, their School of Government and Public Policy. And the one that's not shown here um, is PMRA, Public Management Research Association. It's the association that this conference belongs to. Um, we were the producers and the conference belongs to them. So all three of us had a stake in producing this conference. You can be hosting it as a part of another conference. So for example, um, the National Parks and Recreation Association. Um, so people who oversee national parks, uh, parks around the United States. Um, not just national federal parks, but any type of parks in the United States. They were hosting their conference here last month. And so as a part of that, the Arizona Parks and Recreation Association, they did a mini conference in tandem with that to showcase a lot of the Arizona components. So NPRA did theirs and then AZPRA did their conference or a miniature conference in tandem with the national conference. These partnerships really can help drive attendance to your conference, but what is most important to this is to understand who does what. So a MOU, a memorandum of understanding are necessary before you agree to do a conference, because if there is not a general understanding of who gets what and who does what, it can get money that may benefit one organization more than the other. And sometimes that's okay, but it's better to play in good faith. So when an MOU is done, you really wanna understand who is doing what. So this PMRC conference is a good example. We did not have a formal MOU. By the time that I got here, it's like, should we do an MOU? It was too late to do that because of what would need to take place between three entities to produce this, um, to produce this conference and to do an MOU, it would take too long to get that drawn up just because of how the legal systems work within each of the universities. And as well as the association being a smaller association, they have to contract with another lawyer. So we chose not to do an MOU. I wasn't a fan of it, but it was actually okay because ultimately, since I was the primary producer, my organization, School of Public Affairs, benefited the most. But you can outline who does what, who is responsible for handling the registration, who is responsible for handling sponsorships, who is responsible for the production of the event, who's responsible for each little thing. So for this conference, primarily Arizona State University was responsible for producing everything related to the conference. We did everything from A through Z, booking all the facilities, communicating with attendees, collecting the money, paying folks, we did everything. U of A was responsible for providing the facility for the pre-conference, 
faculty did certain things and then PMRC, PMRA, my apologies, the association was responsible for marking it out to <laughs> relevant attendees. And then they also did provide some programmatic support. Then it also talks about who pays for what, who's paying for the facilities, who's paying for the food, who's the, ultimately the financial administrator for the conference. Um, in the event that there is a, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a profit, how is that money divided amongst the partnering organizations? Is it divided? Is it not divided? That can be decided. And then also really important right now when it comes to the protection of data, who gets what data? Um, so for example, with this, there's nothing that says I have to tell U of A or PMRA what group, who attended the conference and their data. I can provide it in an aggregate. Now in good faith, we're gonna share with each of the organizations um, because it does benefit and it's, since it's education, it's not like we're selling something to these folks. Um, but let's say I wouldn't necessarily share this data. Let's say the same attendees were attending my NACO conference, but I'm not gonna share it within the sponsorship, a sponsor who does not benefit from that or who did not pay to benefit from that. And when we talk about registration, we can talk about do not share your information and all that stuff. So once you've developed your partners, you can then begin thinking about how you're going to develop your team. Um, so when you're thinking about this, you generally have, I broke it down to kind of four categories here on the screen. You have your chair, which is generally your board or your president of the organization. So this is gonna be the person who's ultimately developing the conference, you, your leader, and who is the ultimate decision maker. Who is the one that says, yes, we're going to do this, or who's not going to do this? Like I said, some things may be a board decision. Some things may be a single person who can make the decision. Depends on each organization. Then you have your logistics events manager. That's generally you. This is the person who is the keeper of everything. They're responsible for putting it all together. They're the glue of the conference, the foundation. Everything relies on them to an extent. They support all the other aspects. Another important group is your marketing communications team. Depending how it's organized, they're going to be your messenger, your storyteller, and your communicator. They're going to communicate on your behalf to your attendees. So you want to make sure you have a good foundation there. And then other roles to consider are your education program managers. So people who are going to be the ones really responsible for the educational component. Sponsorships, I highly recommend, depending on the level of your conference, to have someone who is dedicated to soliciting and working with your sponsors. Um, it can be a lot, depending on how many people you have, and you want to make sure your sponsors have a good recommendation. Your finance manager, who is that ultimate financial administrator who's going to manage the finances. And depending on the level of the conference and how large, you may want a dedicated registration manager, someone who is designed for building the registration system, being that person communicating back and forth with attendees on the behalf of the organization or association. Depending on how large, depends on how many of these things you can fund. And a lot of times, some of these things can be done where it's a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A contract basis where I'm going to pay somebody $2,000 over the course of three months to manage my registration. It just depends on the size of the organization. So the next slides are an example of an, exo uh, an association chart. So this is at the top here, you see it's the association board. They are the ultimate decision makers. Um, you have on one side, you have your meeting planner and just some, not all, some of their functions I put under their registration, food and beverage, technology, hotel, just four key functions. They may oversee a lot of other things under there. Then on the right-hand side, you have your programming. This side is generally volunteer-driven by the association, members of the association, um, if you're doing a traditional association. They're going to be the ones responsible for selecting the keynote, what type of networking sessions you're going to have, what educational sessions and what people are going to learn, 
as well as many other things such as ancillary activities, gamification, and whatnot. So that's an example of an org chart. Now, finally, we're going to go into high-level scheduling. And this is going to be on pages 255 and 256. One thing I like to do is map out, and you can do this in Excel, you can do this in, on a whiteboard, draw it out, whatever works for you. But what you want to do is break out what's going to take place at your conference on an hour-by-hour -hour basis in each day. You want to know what group is doing what at any given time, because what that's going to allow you to do is make sure that you have a space and a responsible party for each of those. So what are your sponsors and exhibitors doing at every single time? Are they, when are they loading in? Where are they, when are they eating? When are they programming? When are they loading out? What are your attendees doing? What sessions are they in? Where are they networking? Are they Taking a break, breaks are absolutely necessary. What are your staff doing? You always wanna make sure you build in time that is um, not going to interfere with the session, with the overall conference schedule for you to have staff meetings and touch bases because that's how you evaluate what takes place each day and to move things forward and address any concerns. Uh, if it's an association and your board or corporate, your executive team, when do they have to have meetings? You make sure you want to plan for that. And think about any other component that is a part, any other attendee, not attendee, stakeholder that's attending the conference, what are they doing? You can check Canvas for additional resources. I'm going to post some links. And as well as you can see the textbook with those two pages that has a sample schedule of your typical association agenda. So that concludes this week's lecture. Beginning in the next week, we're going to move into module three, where we begin talking about speakers, speaker management.